Hello and welcome. Good afternoon to all of you here today, and good evening and good morning to so many of you who are remote. I'm thrilled to bits and bytes to be with all of you here in person and digitally in whatever device you choose to uh, see me today. <clears throat> I see so many people here, so many familiar faces as well. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, it's very reassuring to see a lot of our customers come back. A lot of exciting stuff to share with you, uh, product innovations, a cool demo, and finally some great customer journeys. Bob talked to us today about how digital economy businesses are transforming every fa uh, facet of our life. Let me just bring home this point. Let me introduce Stephanie, a denizen of the digital world. She can run every aspect of her life from this digital world. She can shop anything from the first book that was ever sold all the way to homes and cars these days online. She can get hot meals delivered or fresh ingredients with a great recipe delivered that could be uh, uh, fresh home-cooked cook, home cooked food could be made. She can have her chauffeur pull the car up to the front. It's a minor detail that he's part-timing and we are time-sharing the car, but she can do that. She has a travel agent in her fingertips. She wants to plan any travel. She can jump on a conference call and get on with her colleagues, uh, any business, also get on with her customers. Uh, she can do her HRM, CRM, expenses, payroll, everything online. And if she gets tired of all these things, she can take a break, stream a movie, or play a game. Life, work, play, everything is possible in this digital world. It is a digital revolution that we are all in the middle of. And who is causing this digital revolution, and who is the consumer of all of this. It is us. We are the consumers who are driving this digital re revolution. It is by us and for us. And this digital revolution typically leads to the next phase of a social economic evolution. That's what we are seeing here. We have come from Stone Age to Bronze Age to Iron Age to the Agriculture Age then the industrial age, which had multiple phases in it, where you started with uh, steam-based and electricity-based and finally oil-based. Now we are in the information age. They say a key characteristic has to appear, a key attribute, which has to be of low cost, which has to be of unlimited supply, which has to be uh, all-pervasive, and something that basically reduces the cost of goods and services while improving the quality dramatically. What is that key factor in this case, you ask, and you already know? It is data. It is this data. You can have all the compute and all the network in the world, but what do you transact on? It is the data. You have to crunch with all the CPUs, and you have to transport this data so it becomes useful for communication. And this data is complex. It's growing and it's omnipresent. Now, people used to think this data is all about the unstructured data. That's where all this conversation has been, and it is somehow all about blogs and tweets. It is not. A lot of business and mission-critical data is actually the one that is really causing this revolution. And how do you generate this data? Every breath she takes and every move she makes, I'm a bad singer. Oh, can't you see? It's data. It's that data that really powers this whole thing. Every action we take in this digital world is generating data. Now, it's the web, mobile, and IoT applications that we are so accustomed to using uh, which powers this data generation. Now, let's step back and take a look at how uh, we have been developing applications. How has the application stack developed? Once upon a time, 
there were mainframes. It was a frame. Anything you wanted to do, it was inflexible. Application change, or if you want to scale, you had to get, you have to pre-order these boxes, and they will come after a long delay, and that's the only way you could make an application change, or if you want a larger box for your new needs. This was the mainframe. There was no flexibility at all in these systems. Then we evolved to where networks were a little bit more ubiquitous. And this introduced client-server computing. Now more users could use this, because in desktops you could do applications. And now tiers of separation emerged, application tier and the data tier. And two major things happened here in the data tier. First was the relational model. This allowed you to create relationships between naturally existing entities, a customer, an order, and an address. And the second thing was SQL. This actually separated query from the rest of the data management. How do you place it? How do you move it? All that stuff from which was independent of how you want to query the data. This liberated the application development. Then the internet happened. Now we have a new tier, the web tier, that basically showed up. Now, the application evolved much faster. Various concerns of the different tiers were addressed by uh, services, if you will. We had the web tier. You had your web forms, which could scale independent of your app application and the, and the middle tier, the logic tier, so to say. But the database remained the same. And it's a good thing. The lower you are in the stack, you, your primary job is to provide stability. And if, you're, if your lower stack evolves too fast, then the higher up in the, in the stack, instability is what shows up. So the database was a solid platform on which you could develop your applications. This is the evolution that happened with the introduction of internet. Then web 2.0 sort of phase happened, which introduced um, the social and mobile applications. This is when the dramatic data explosion really happened. The unstructured part of the data started to come here, and this was coming at us at speeds we just couldn't handle. So now the data tier evolved, where it actually solved that problem of being able to manage more and more data without vertically scaling the system. And that is the uh, shared nothing distributed architecture, which basically helped with this. Now you had scale out systems. When, when I was describing to you about the relational system, it did two things. One was the, it gave you the flexibility of data modeling, and it gave you the querying flexibility. In this evolution, we got data organization flexibility. This also gave us schema flexibility. Very important thing for the applications to develop faster. But the data modeling flexibility and the query flexibility were gone. You pretty much had a single document model and full table scans in this world. And so you had solutions which were schema flexible but could not scale, or you had solutions which could great, greatly scale, but it was, a flex, uh, it was a rigid data model or column family. These were sort of the various solutions that were floating around in the NoSQL phase, if you call them. So what you got at this phase was schema flexibility and the data placement flexibility, but you lost the querying flexibility as well as the data modeling flexibility. Basically, lost joints. So what should this post-NoSQL picture look like from a database perspective, from the standpoint of an evolution? What we should really look forward in this phase should be an evolution where it is based on the history, based on learning from the past. So what we are looking to do here is to build a database system which offers you all levels of flexibility. It should have query flexibility, it should have modeling flexibility, it should have data placement flexibility, which is scale out or elasticity, and finally schema flexibility. If you have such a system, to that 
if you can throw, uh, flexibility in terms of how you can provision diff different parts of the database. Because at the, the constituent parts of a database turns out to a data access, a query, an indexing. These are primarily the systems. You can add more to it, but this is where it starts. If you can isolate each one of them and bring the microservice architecture into it and allow each independent component to scale independent of the other, now this fits right into the elastic fabric model that all the data centers are provisioned. Now this gives you a database which will withstand the test of time. That is the insight based on which we started to build Couchbase. Now let's look at the landscape of how the database tier, the data management tier looks now. If you were to uh, put up your web, mobile, and IoT applications and expect 5.9 uptimes and availability, you have a relational system in which you will fit in your object somehow. And then you have a cache to speed, up, speed this up. Now you quickly want to search something. You'll copy this data into a search system. Now you can worry about multiple copies and consistency and all that stuff. You will have an OLAP system for quick reporting. You'll have a data warehouse where you want to move this data for complex reporting. And if you want even more insights, you have a Hadoop system. In the middle of it someplace, you had a mobile initiative, mobile first. And somehow you'll cobble together a very custom and purpose-built mobile solution to get the data across to the mobile devices. This is the landscape. With Couchbase, now, what you can do is a system wherein it consolidates a cache and a database to one. That's how we started to build this. To that, we introduced secondary indexing capability and built a query language on top of it, which is Nickel, which is the SQL 92-based query, query language that we built. It's a query language. I want to emphasize that. It's not an API. It separates. It separates the what from the how. You don't have to set up an object and iterators and all that stuff. You simply specify in English what you want to get done, and it'll do it. The rest of the predicate and other logic kicks underneath in the tiers below. It doesn't have to be exposed to the application. You can simply do a select star from, and the rest of the stuff will happen. So this is Nickel, which is based on a nested recursive model and nested recursive algebra, which has got what we call a transitive closure. So if you take any JSON, any part of a JSON, apply the SQL pipeline, out comes another JSON into which you can do further SQL processing. That's what we added here. We have a mobile solution, which we have a local database and a sync service, so any application, any data that you generate there can be transported to a mobile device. The mobile application that you're writing can be location unaware. If the data is available locally, it'll use it. If it is not, it'll, and network is available, it'll fetch the data from the server. So that gives you a, a complete system at this point to build database applications. We have still a lot of work to do to catch up to 40 years of uh, innovations here in the, in the relational world and the database world, but we have done a lot of good work so far. You'll hear how customers are using this. Now, since we had workload isolation and we have this independent scaling of different parts of the system, you can scale the indexes different from the data. Data inherently can be distributed, but indexes, if they are central, it is better. It's like your library. When you go ask for a book that you don't know where to find, they'll typically look up, in the good old days at least, a drawer which has got the index cards, and you can look at the index card. The indexes are central. Data could be in fifth floor or second shelf. So that's the, the insight on which we basically separate the index partitioning from the data partitioning that gives you more flexibility in terms of how we can deploy this. Now, can we extend that further? That was the question we asked. Can we bring more logic to the data instead of moving the data to the logic? That's exactly what was happening in that picture. Every connector that you have is basically moving the data to some other place to do the logic. Why? Because you felt like either the systems were independently built or a certain system characteristics does not fly well with your operational database. It might eat up the resources there. So if we can bring logic to the data and have that logic isolated and 
working independent of the other services, it will achieve the same thing. But in this integration, it simplifies, it consolidates, and at the end of it, it gives you much increased performance. So with this insight, we announced a few months ago Search. Search is another system which can now be another service in Couchbase that you can actually Fantastic, sorry. Search is another system which is now consolidated. So this is the full text search that we are all used to. This has got the tokenizing pipeline where you can do your tokenization, stop words, um, all your lexers and parsers and stemming, and create an inverted index and store this. You can do facets on it. And there's a rich query side of it from which you can basically look for phrases terms, fuzzy match, every capability is available. So the data goes in once, and out comes a very simple tokenized way of looking at this. So the data is not moved. The new index is created instantaneously. And in one platform, now you can do a structured query and a tokenized search. We can extend this further. I think you guys can see the pattern. Today. We are announcing Couchbase Analytics. This is another service that is added to this platform, and you can do complex queries here. You can find insights now in the same platform without the data moving. Yet another piece of logic comes to the data. So here you can find insights by looking at trends and patterns. This is a massively parallel MPP architecture-based system. And here we expect a lot more data to be sitting on disk. And so we can do the MPP massively parallel queries and get you the, uh, the data without this workload impeding your operational. You can still have millions of ops per second of a KV and a query happening in your OLTP part of the system. And this service runs independently these queries can take a few seconds and minutes. This will not impede with the other. So you can find the insight. And what this will drive is more intelligent applications. These insights will feed right back into the application. And now you can actually have applications which are a lot more intelligent. I mean, any time you have an application which has got a list of something to show, currently either you'll sort by first name, last name, or some alphabetic, or some ID. You don't need to. There is always a context on which you are operating. Perhaps that context could be supplied by this insight, and you can look at the most recent or the one that is most closest to you, people who are, who, who are your neighbors, so to say, in terms of what you do, where they are looking at, or based on your common interests. So this kind of a system can be built, which will basically make every application context aware. You are the context. There is no other context required. And your previous actions can influence how the application will change. You can almost, in an application, make a heat map and see which part of the application you use more and customize the entire look and feel. A lot of magical stuff can happen. Recommendations can happen here. If uh, Stephanie bought uh, a dress, there could be recommendations of what else based on the buying patterns of people. At the same time, there could be a partner application where if Stephanie was buying other stuff over there and these two patterns could be matched and there could be partner-based content displayed here. So this is the kind of system where you will basically find in one platform where you can do data retrieval, information, and insight. So it's the one platform where you can do all, uh, build an application which can have all these three characteristics. Now, let me take you through how this is from the bottoms up. Meet Stephanie again in her digital form here. This is the JSON. This is the profile of Stephanie here. Now, you can find Stephanie using a primary key value access. Given the ID, find Stephanie. This is a very uh, highly performant because you know the ID fetch the value is your query here. You can do a secondary index query by looking for Stephanie based on her email ID. 
This is our second thing, indexing infrastructure that we have built here. We have done a lot of creative stuff here. We have built covering indexes, array indexes, uh, memory optimized indexes, which is a very key innovation, and we presented papers on this in BLDB. This is based on uh, what we call as lockless skip lists. It is not the usual B3, because when you have a B3, eventually when you want to update, you always end up locking a portion of the tree, and that causes contention, locks. The lockless skip list is the data structure which allows us to do concurrent writes. Uh, there should be a session by Sharath tomorrow. If you want more details, that's a good one to get to understand how we achieve this. This gives us almost near performances of a key value when you do a secondary uh, index update. So it's a memory optimized indexes. Now, if you see in this JSON, you're seeing this is the nested recursive object form here because you're seeing in social an array of objects. So it's an object, Stephanie, that that whole document is itself an object. Within that, there's an array of objects. So you can query into that as well. This is a new capability we build called array indexing. You can find every element in that array, index it, put the SQL pipeline on it, get the data out, and you can do further. This is a recursive part where you can apply further SQL, SQL pipelining on it. So you can do subqueries and all those other capabilities. Now, if you see in JSON, you will also have a lot of unstructured data. The data is information is sitting inside it. So you can now, with the introduction of search, find that information as well. Who likes cats? You can just simply search for a cat. This could be sitting anywhere in the schema. You don't know where it is going to be. So you can issue a search, a token-based query, and you can find that Stephanie uh, will show up in that result set because she loves cats. Now, if you want, you can do further complex querying here, which is if you want to match all those people who have interest in cats who live in 94004, this is a fairly sophisticated query that you can run. That's where analytics comes into play because now you can recommend to Stephanie other people with common interests and how she can get together. So this is one platform on which you can build an application which uses data, index, and query, which can be independently scaled. This application, this data, can be replicated across data centers. It's a memory-to-memory -memory replication. The only delay is your network lag here. So in mil microseconds and milliseconds, data can go to the next data center. Many customers use almost active-active sort of deployments here. So that's for either disaster recovery or for uh, geolocation of data. So uh, your end users, if they are in EMEA, they can get closer to data and not all the data that you have in every data center needs to be replicated. We have filter replication and other capabilities here. We actually are introducing with our next release in 4.6 uh, time-based replication. We have hybrid logical clocks, uh, some magic in there in terms of how you can do last write wins equivalent um, functionality there and still allow for time drift because you eventually end up with that when you have multi-data centers with uh, clock synchronization issues. So we have XTCR. We also have the sync gateway, which can move the data from the cloud to the mobile devices, to the edge, because the data you want out there in those devices is far smaller than what is sitting in, in the cloud. So this enables you to build always-on applications because the data is local. It is not about network. It's about data locality. So your application is fully functional. So you can build a mobile application to this, we are adding in developer preview uh, search, which you can do the tokenized lookup, and finally, insights using the analytics. If Couchbase were just a NoSQL platform, we wouldn't be talking about scale up and scale out. If Couchbase were just a NoSQL database, we wouldn't be talking about fully connected and occasionally connected applications. If Couchbase were just a NoSQL database, we wouldn't be talking about structured query and search. And we wouldn't be talking about operational query and analytical query all running on the same platform. We are redefining the database. This is beyond NoSQL. 
That's where we are headed. More will be expected of a database in the future. That's why I'm building it like this. It's just like you cannot go to the present generation and say, the only can thing you can do with your phone is make phone calls. They won't understand that. You mean you can't listen to a song in your phone? You mean I cannot Snapchat with my friend? That's their question. So that's the kind of expectation that we have when you consolidate layers and you can bring a lot of value. In a database, your expectation will be more than just retrieve data. You'll expect to retrieve information. You'll expect to find insights because there's going to be so much data. Just retrieving data for operational purposes will be only one function. I have given a pretty good overview of what this platform is and what it is capable of. But I think it'll be better for us to actually see this in action and to give you a, a live demonstration of how all of this comes together. I'm going to invite up to the stage Perry Krug, who has always been my partner in crime in uh, all these events. So Perry, please come on up and give us a preview of this application. Good to have you. Thank you, Ravi. Good to be here again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to be able to present uh, to you. Um, so Perry, what have you been working? Yeah. So, so Ravi, like we did uh, a couple years ago with the auction industry, and mm -hmm. like we did last year with the, the travel industry, uh, we thought this year we would uh, revolutionize the talent search uh, industry, both for ourselves and for our customers to find developers, find engineers, find those best uh, qualified for us to, to hire. Um, so we built an application called Git Talent. Git, Git what? Git, Git Talent. Get talent. You see, we noticed uh, that so many of our developers and prospective engineers mm -hmm. uh, are using GitHub. Yes. That we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could pull in all of that data um, and, and use it uh, to, to find the next uh, developer that we wanted, to, we wanted to hire? Fantastic. Give us a preview of what's in there. Yeah, so if we can show my, there we are. Um, so this is what Git Talent looks like. Um, and, and here we have uh, a list of developers uh, that we can quickly scroll through. Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. And what is this that I see? I'm a list of developers is what we're seeing here. What can you look up? What's that look up on the, the left? Yeah, this is where we can enter someone's first name and last name and find a specific developer. You can find a specific developer for me? Pick, pick any developer. Okay, let's pick Nick. Nick Raboy. Nick Raboy, one of our... Oops, let's click on that. He thing. helped write some of this application, so I'm a little partial. Nick, there we are. We see his uh, entry come up there. We can quickly click view um, and see Nick's uh, shining, smiling face here. He just had a baby, so congratulations, Nick. Um, we have his first name, his last name, the repositories that he's uh, contributed to, uh, the tickets that he's been, uh, been a part of, all uh, right from this interface. Fantastic. Nick. Congratulations first, and second, Nick is a serious enterprise developer. How is it that I'm not seeing uh, a LinkedIn or uh, some, something other than just Twitter and a Facebook? Well, I mean, Ravi, this is just a prototype, right? We, we had to build the app to get it out quickly, uh, get some feedback on it. We couldn't possibly conceive every possible uh, addition to it. Not acceptable, Perry. Got to change this thing. This is the digital age. You just have to adapt. Uh, you're always adding requirements to me. That's my uh, middle of the demo. Uh, all right, let's see what we have here. Um, so if I come over to our GitHub page, um, and I'm, this is where the app is, is hosted out of, um, and we're on the, the social media uh, mm -hmm. part of this, um, I think I should be able to uh, come down here uh, somewhere um, in the middle. Yep, we, we left a section for you here. Um, Thank you. So if I add. <laughs> Uh, if I add just a, a string, uh, a couple methods, uh, that's, that's all that's needed, uh, then I can scroll down, um, and I'm going to commit this change. So we're going to add LinkedIn because Ravi demanded it in my demo. Uh, well, the commit, animals. Commit the change. I'm the bad guy now. Fantastic. So we've committed these changes to, to mm -hmm. GitHub. And if we come over, this is going to now trigger uh, into our Jenkins uh, instance. Uh, we come over here. Uh, to our Git Talent uh, backend. You see there's a new task uh, building here. Uh, so we can click on this. Uh, you see that it's the, the commit message that I, that I put in there. 
Uh, we can keep an eye on the, the console output. It went through, and all of this is built on a Spring, a mm -hmm. spring data backend mm -hmm. uh, with an Angular front end, so it's going through and, and rebuilding Building that. This. Uh, recompiling it, it's pushing it out to our various environments. So you see we have a couple uh, AWS environments, could be our uh, development and staging uh, production environment, um, and then it's done. Fantastic. So now, uh, what does that mean? If we come back to the to Nick's profile mm -hmm. um, and we refresh this page, uh, we should see there we are. Now we have a LinkedIn profile available there. Thank I can you. Go in. Fantastic, <laughs> and you can add add Nick. Lovely name Fantastic. there. Fantastic. Save that, and now it's part of his profile. Fantastic. You made a schema change on the fly to me, it looks like, Perry. How, first, show me all this magic. You, you, I think, put in four lines and hit two buttons, and magically I'm seeing that the application has changed. Exactly. Just like so many of our, of our customers out there are, are being asked to, to, make asked to make to add new uh, requirements on demand, change their application. Um, and, and you know this would have been very hard with a relational database. Mm -hmm. um, but because of Couchbase's JSON uh, flexibility and our integration with the continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, pipeline. So let me, let me show you what we, what we had there. Sure. Um, so this is just a, a quick picture uh, of, our, of our, some of our architecture. Um, you see that Git push that I did uh, up into GitHub, mm -hmm. uh, goes over and, and triggers through a webhook our Jenkins interface uh, instance that's going to rebuild the Spring backend, set up the Angular uh, front end, push that out to, to one or more of our uh, Amazon instances that are running on top of a, of a Couchbase cluster, and then that, that application is able to see the change live. Fantastic. So this basically pushed out all the way from your code change to all the, the Java code change, the Angular code change, uh, did the compilation and pushed it to your cloud deployments where the application was running. Exactly. What's happening underneath it? There must be application changes. What's sure, application sure. So as, as I said, um, uh, this is all generated and, and done through Spring Data. Mm -hmm. uh, so Spring Data takes care of uh, a lot of the, the work for us. But uh, under the covers, it's running our nickel queries there. Uh, so you see uh, the kind of query looks very much like SQL, but, mm -hmm. but that's nickel there um, to get a list of so developers. So are you expecting developers to learn uh, SQL syntax? Well, they, you can write this directly. Uh, mm -hmm. But Spring Data, through our integration with it, will do a lot of the work for you, a lot of the, uh, the POJO creation, a lot of the, the, uh, the query uh, setup. So you, write you, get the, these. you write your program in Java, the rest of it happens underneath it magically. It, it, exactly. And there we have on the bottom the, the query to look up one developer like we did with Nick. I asked a very pointed question there, so I know a little bit more dangerously. So I'm sure there are schema changes and stuff like that that would be required to make that application change I asked. What do you, what's the schema? What's the data model underneath? Sure. Let's let's look at the the data model. Um, so this the the beginning part of this is built mostly on two uh, data models: the developers and the organizations within JSON. Mm -hmm. uh, you see there that first line, that underscore class, that's added by uh, Spring Data uh, natively, and then it builds yeah. the rest of the the JSON um, uh, POJO and, and object there. Um, if we look at the developer, um, really what we added to to Nick's profile was a little was a new entry uh, mm -hmm. in that social media uh, array um, to give him. A, a LinkedIn profile. Fantastic. So you basically added an element to an array. It's almost like if we were in the relational world, we'll be adding intersection tables and foreign keys and taking things down and up. But here you just added one object to your array, and the rest of it was magic. After that, your CI CD stuff kicked in and you. Exactly. So a small change to the application, uh, a small change to Nick's profile. We didn't have to go and change everybody's profile. Yes. Not everybody has a LinkedIn profile. Yes. Um, and so Nick can have his, while everybody else continues to have what they had before. Fantastic. So that gives you a sense of how the schema flexibility works. There are going to be records sitting there which may not have this and yet there are going to be records sitting in the database which has this schema change. So the query, the nickel language can handle both, uh, both this uh, situation. We have syntax like is missing versus is null. Go to the nickel session so you guys will learn more than what I'm talking about here. So um, now, Perry, I know dangerously enough about uh, Git. Every time you're committing something, there's always a lot more that goes into it, both in your comments and what else you do. A lot of unstructured data sitting there. 
What can we do with that? Yeah, so as we were importing this data, we, we noticed that the, the GitHub API uh, exposes all of these as, as events. And an event is everything from a new repository creation, a repository change. Mm -hmm. uh, every commit message has a, uh, every commit has a, a message and a description along with it. So we noticed that there was a lot of uh, freeform text uh, in there that we wanted to be able to, to search over. Fantastic. Now, I, I know even more dangerously about other stuff. So this must be a lot of conversation going on about Docker. And a lot of these projects would be basically deployed on virtual environments and Very Docker. Very true. So could we sort of search for what people are doing on Docker now? I, I think we can. Um, and, and you know, Couchbase uh, supports Docker as well these days. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go into here, and we, we have this search bar at the, at the top of the screen. Uh, if I can zoom in a little bit on it. Um, and this is built off of the, the Couchbase full text search uh, engine. So no other uh, technology or, is needed there. If we put in Docker here, preview. be careful. Um, we come back with a list over, over all, of the, uh, all of the data uh, in this system, the tickets, the organizations, the developers, uh, nice. and we can pull out the, the terms that match Docker. Lovely. It can do text highlighting and other stuff. But what's this now I see? It says drill down. It is not a lookup, it's a drill down now. Oh yeah, over, over here, um, this is our faceted navigation. And uh, the Couchbase full text search uh, supports uh, facets where we group um, terms of uh, similar terms together. If we drill down on developer, uh, we can quickly see a, a list of all of the, the languages that all of the developer objects mm -hmm. uh, associate with, uh, with Docker in their, in their profiles. Fantastic, this now gives me ideas, Perry. Oh no. Is there a way? They can look at the trend now. As uh, I would love to see what's happening with different programming languages in Docker, which is, uh, you know, which is popular, or where, where are things going? So, I mean, here you have a, a list of just kind of a snapshot of the, the current state of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what you're asking for is kind of a, a trend over time, uh, all of these GitHub events into the, into the past. Um, so, I mean, normally what we would have to do is we'd have to suck all of this data out of the operational system and, mm -hmm. and move it into something like Teradata or, God forbid, uh, Oracle or something. Um, <laughs> But, but now with the, the Couchbase analytics service uh, that we launched in developer preview today, mm -hmm. um, we, can, we can do some of this right within Couchbase. So let me just give you a quick hint for, of, of what that, the complexity involved there. Um, the, the events data mm -hmm. um, tells us all of the different commits and changes to a particular repository. But it doesn't tell us which language uh, each of those commits was in. Mm -hmm. All of that information is stored over on the developer document. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually fairly challenging to combine these two data sets and do a secondary join mm -hmm. uh, across uh, those, those different elements. So Nickel is designed for very, very high performance operational queries where you're doing uh, primary key joins um, in, in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, but the analytics service is really designed for slightly longer running queries over uh, much larger sets of, of data where we need to do ad hoc queries or, or unindexed joins across these secondary elements. Um, so I, I thought you might ask me this question. Yes. Um, and so within the application, uh, we built ourselves a little analytics tab. And if I oh, click on that, um, it takes a couple seconds, uh, but in less than five, uh, we get a picture uh, of over the last year, uh, all of the commits uh, to, to a subset of the, the languages. And you can, you can see this query over here. It's a, Fairly complex query, yeah. uh, multiple select statements coming yes. together and, and being joined together. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it's a pretty complex, sophisticated query. All less than five seconds. Over, what's the data set? How big is the data set? Uh, this one is about 250 million items. So it's not, it's more than a little demo environment, I would say. Uh, I see that's the most popular, the way to go is go, is it? Go it is. Go is the way. Now. Uh, there are a lot of other data, which is sort of, if you can, is there any dynamic thing you can do there? To so the, the Angular front end gives us some, some nice tools. We can deselect Go and get kind of a different distribution of seeing that Ruby and Python, uh, or, or Ruby down on the bottom, Python coming, up, coming and going, Java, that hard to see line right there in the middle. Um, fine. Pulling all this data together. Fantastic. Uh, so Perry, this is fantastic to give a, a, a systemic overview of all that you can build using Couchbase. You can do a query, we did that. You can do a search, and you can do trends analysis on this thing. 
Now, what is the infrastructure this whole thing is running on? Can you show something on the back end? Sure, sure. So just within the app first, we have um, the, the list of nodes that are, that are supporting this. We have about 10 Couchbase nodes. You can see they're, they're running in Amazon. Some have our uh, data service turned on. Some have the full text service, the index service, the query service. Um, and that's showing that we can you know, isolate those workloads. Um, up in the, uh, uh, the deployment, we have one cluster running in uh, the West Coast uh, mm -hmm. region of Amazon, one cluster running in the East Coast, uh, connected with our uh, bi-directional replication. Fantastic. So you have two clusters running, the application is running on those. Now, what is it? What sort of a load is it taking? Is there something going on in the system while you're showing the stuff? Yeah, sure. So, so if we come down and look at one of the clusters, this is the the West Coast cluster. Um, we can kind of drill in and look at the buckets. We have uh, a couple buckets here. The the two main ones, this GitHub GitHub archive, that's mm -hmm. that almost 300 million uh, item uh, one that the analytics was was running off of. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have our default bucket, which is running the the application itself, um, storing the, the developers sure. and the and the organizations. Uh, so if we dive into that one. Um, it's currently running at about 600,000 uh, ops per second. Uh, we can scroll down. You see the about uh, five. What's, what's the workload over there? 600 inserts? Or is it a mixture of reads and writes? It's mostly writes, but we have a, a little bit of reads here, so about 500,000 writes per second. Um, wow. And maybe you want to see if we come down, the, uh, the index uh, is being kept up uh, just about at that, that same wow. speed. Uh, what you're saying is that the key value inserts that you're having there is a little over 500K per second. And the secondary index, which is building for this data inserts, it's also keeping up with it. So the, the memory optimized indexes are actually performing near equal to what the the key value inserts are happening. Exactly, and this is, these are, as you said, the memory optimized indexes, we're streaming as that write comes in, streaming RAM to RAM mm -hmm. uh, over the network, and the index is able to, to keep up with that, that speed. I mean, secondary indexes of that speed, uh, it's magic. So get to know more about the system. It's a fantastic <laughs> achievement. What else, what else do you want to see, Ravi? Give me what something. What else do here. I want what to see? What else do you see? want to see? Uh, you're throwing challenges at me. Now I see what's that, uh, the, the query tab over there. Can I sort of look at, if I'm a DBA, do I need to go stand in behind a developer to see, write me a little program so I can uh, look into my data? No, no. So with 4.5, we, we added our query workbench. Um, and so this gives you uh, the ability to run nickel queries right on the, the cluster itself. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I, I have one uh, prepared here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, looking at Laurent's profile, another uh, developer who helped build this application. Um, if we run the query um, in, in about half a second, it comes back. Um, and you can see this is Laurent's JSON. Uh, he had a LinkedIn uh, profile in there as well. He doesn't have a Twitter uh, handle. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely to see how the schema can change. And you can look at all this. I mean, what do I see that after JSON? There's a table and a tree and... Sure, so this, this interface will, will automatically kind of restructure the data uh, sure. depending on the format that, that you want. This is a table view and a, and a tree view. Uh, different, different JSON Pretty structures reviews. have different uh, natural kind of visualizations. Sure. Fantastic. That's, that's the data that you can actually go to a cluster and start to visualize it just so that you can see what's sitting in the database instance. Yep. Fantastic. Now, um, you mentioned to me that you have two instances running there. Uh, is there an XDCR setup? Oh yeah, let me let me show you that as well. So it's it's pretty simple. Um, we have this cluster replicating to our uh, AWS East cluster, um, and mm -hmm. both of those buckets are uh, uh, are replicating. Okay. So, so if I were to ask this question, Perry, uh, when you set up these replications, uh, what are you expecting? What what's the your your set up here? Ra is Ra uh, sorry, hold on, hold on just a second, um, uh, Ravi. We you're getting called. Yeah, I'm getting, hold on, Ravi. Dip, Dipti, I'm, I'm just kind of in the middle of something here. What's, what's up? Yeah, I thought so. Well, looks like our crowd infrastructure is having some issues. So just check on that, will you? Some, some issues. What do you, what do you mean? Uh, all right, all right. Hold on, Dipti. Um, Ravi, wait, wait, just a second. I would. Oh no. Uh, uh, oh. Oh no. The cluster is the, the, the whole, the whole region is. He's actually uh, oh. working, not talking. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I think it's okay. Is it? We replicated this to the other region. Yes. Um, so the, the app looks like it's still, it's still up and running. Um, How do you know? I, oh, let, let, me, let me just test, hold on, let me just test things here. If I search for Nick and look at his profile, and um, yeah, there's that, that LinkedIn uh, that thing we added. we added. So this, this, this side of the application is working. You're okay. showing this to me from the other one. From, from the, the East Coast cluster, yeah, yeah. 
this guy thinks of everything. But, but wait, but wait. Let me really see if this guy is really doing it correctly. I hope it's not read-only copy. No, no, no. You know the Show Couchbase. Show me you can write in this one. Couchbase is a multi-master replication, so we should be OK. Uh, let's see if we go back here. Now, uh, I happen to know that my uh, profile is not stored here yet. Let's see. Um, so if I search for my name, um, we see that it's not there. That's OK. We expect that. Okay. Uh, but to prove to you that I can write into this cluster, yes. uh, we're going to add me. Yep, see, there I am. Magic. I mean, what I'm surprised is that you're sitting on a search, you're, you queried for something, nothing was there, and you added yourself, and that query instantaneously shows that the data that has gone in there. Yep, it's written it's into phenomenal. the cluster, and the Angular front end is reactively showing it right to us. Reactive programming. The data goes in, and the application shows. This is, to me, it's magic. We don't do full page refreshes and other stuff. The data comes in. Fantastic, query. You set up two clusters, and you showed that magically the application can work from the other one. So this is 5.9 uptime, and you can actually read more than read. You can write into that other cluster as well. Exactly. Fantastic, Perry. And we saw so much stuff today, and they keep challenging you. You keep seem to have the right answers for me. I'm impressed as usual. Thank you, Thank Robbie. you so much. It's been a pleasure. Perry. A lot of people worked hard at this stuff. Perry is one of them. Uh, a lot of the developer advocates build this, and there's a great engineering team standing behind this to make this whole thing happen. So please, a round of applause for all those guys who worked really hard. Thank you. Now, this is a demo. Of course, you can all, one day we will actually, uh, pretty soon, this application will be available for you to uh, get to know more about the system, actually take this as a sample, and work on it. Everything will be available. Please follow uh, our developer advocates and other engineers who are active, uh, and you can get to that application and play with it to get to know more. Now, we saw demo. I want to show you what customers are doing in real deployments, what serious customers are doing in the deployments now. United needs no introduction one of the largest fleets, largest destinations, 12,000 odd pilots, 150 million passengers uh, transported in a year. You can imagine how sophisticated their back-end operation ought to be to uh, make sure that they maintain their arrival and departure times. This entire application is written, and uh, currently it works from a mainframe application. They have chosen, and they are developing, their next generation on Couchbase. Why? They wanted schema flexibility so that the application can be dynamically changed and it can be uh, deployed to their pilots, their crew, and their schedulers. Uh, they, of course, wanted performance. And most importantly, they required a familiar programming language. So Nickel was a major reason for them to go with Couchbase for this application that is called uCrew. This is the one that manages uh, the screw scheduling uh, because there are not just a complexity of an organization. On top of it, they have very sophisticated business rules because FAA and other governance uh, kicks into play here. They want to externalize business rules from mainframes, and Couchbase is the platform that they're building in. This is a serious, mission critical. Some of our lives depend on it application that they're actually developing on Couchbase. Entirely uh, other division is actually developing a customer-facing application um, in which they're using Couchbase Lite and Couchbase Sync Gateway uh, for their mobile wallet project. This application, we all know the United uh, mobile app, it has won awards. And I think it's been downloaded more than 20 million times. So you can imagine how popular that application is. And with 140 million passengers being ferried in a year, you can imagine how much um, usage that application gets. In that, the mobile wallet is the one that keeps all your flight information, your schedules, and most importantly, your uh, boarding pass. So they are using Couchbase Lite with the SYNC gateway to have more and more of this information stored locally, so it's always available to you, whether you have network or not. This also simplifies a lot of stuff in the back end, because you save on all the network bandwidth 
of moving this information back and forth. So this is yet another application which is built on the Couchbase platform. Verizon. Verizon is developing a new platform for IoT. This is a platform where you can IoT, if you have a device which is uh, IP addressable, you can make it an IoT device by developing on this application platform. This is a place where you can develop, deploy, monitor, govern, and basically take care of the entire life cycle of this. This platform, since it's a platform where various enterprises can come and internet enable their thing, uh, it requires, number one, great schema flexibility. Different applications, different enterprises, a smart meter uh, from a connected car or any other uh, device will be different. So you can basically imagine how the schema of the devices will be different. Not just the schema, but the messages that will come from these devices can also dynamically change. So schema flexibility was key. Second is performance, because these devices will have uh, will be sending their messages up. This requires great high ingestion rates, so we need million ops per second of inserts. So this platform, they had that requirement. And a very important requirement was uh, cross data center availability, because they want to make sure that they have multi data center deployment. So if one data center, one region, just like we had in the demo scenario, if a region goes down, it's available in another region. And so it required the XTCR setup so these were the considerations based on which um, uh, Verizon chose Couchbase. United, uh, Verizon, others are talking. They are presenting in this conference. We are very thankful for their presence here. And please uh, get to know more about the details of not only what was their qualification uh, that they ran before they picked a platform, but also what they're experiencing now. So far, what we have seen are Applications that enterprises are planning and building, either to re-platform or to actually set up a new platform for the future. These are all planned. What happens if you have in your hands something totally unplanned, something that just you could not imagine, something which is a social phenomena? This is what happened to Niantic, uh, people who, the people behind Pokemon Go. They had built their entire user management platform on Couchbase. Originally, it was built on a relational system, but they realized that for a certain scale and performance, they chose Couchbase. Now, it was all well planned until it became a phenomenon. Right? They just could not predict the kind of uh, usage that they'll actually get to see. This was the most downloaded app ever in the history. It is the number one uh, app in iTunes now after their um, Halloween refresh. And there are, I hear, more than uh, half a billion downloads of this. So, and every day they were adding about 700,000 users to the system. Every day, that's about 30, imagine 30,000 users an hour. And these are the users they're adding. And you can imagine the concurrency of how many, how many people are playing the games. Only if so many people play the game, would you call it a phenomena? So millions playing concurrently, that was the system. And what happened to them was that they had sufficiently provisioned this for a moderate success, but this blew them out of the water, and they pretty quickly ran into a situation where there was a lot of contention, and their simple user creation, user generation was actually lagging. They worked with us, and within a couple of days, we could just simply add more query and indexing nodes, tune the queries a bit, and they were up and running, flying. Because they had provisioned this in such a fashion that was good enough for the data portion. So without ever moving the data, we just kept adding query and indexing nodes, and their performance bottlenecks just went away. This was phenomenal. If you had done this in any other platform, you would have required you to reshard the data and move the data and you'll have to have had up, up times and down times. Here, they never had a downtime. They just were experiencing throttling in some cases, but pretty quickly that bottleneck was removed and this was just flying. This was a phenomenal success and we were ourselves surprised by how smoothly this whole transition went and memory optimized indexes gave them the kind of performance that they were actually looking for here. 
was a great success story. Uh, we are very proud, very happy, but at the same time very humbled by the trust some of these, these big companies, these pioneers, these leaders place in us. These applications uh, have, did not exist before. We expect more and more applications, new, new types of applications, applications we haven't yet imagined to come to play. Blockchain, device-device interaction, human-device interaction uh, applications, artificial intelligence systems. Uh, there's an insight here, which is that more data with a simple algorithm always beats less data in a complex algorithm. So AI, because of the explosion of data and the explosion of compute, will go a long way as well. There are a lot of creative applications that we are all going to write, that you are all going to write. And we expect to see a completely different application world that is lies, lies in, uh, in front of us. We believe in creativity at Couchbase. We are innovating. We believe we are creating substantial value, value to our customers, our partners, and to our consumers. You are all here because you are doing the same for your customers, your partners, and your consumers. We don't know what the future holds for us, but like they say, the only way to predict future is to create it. So let us together create this brave new digital world. Thank you.